Well, it's so good to have you with us. Again, my name is Casey, if we haven't met. And so those of you that are new with us, we're so glad that you're here, as well as those joining us online. Can we do something? Can we welcome those that are new with us and those joining online? Thank them for joining us today. So grateful that you're joining us on this Thanksgiving weekend. And uh, today we begin a brand new series that's called With My Soul. It's actually like I am Ron Burgundy. And so the reason we put a question mark on this is because we want you to begin to ask a question that we want you to begin to ask, how is your soul? So go ahead and get out your notes, if you will, this morning, open up those notes to the inside and you can follow along today. But in this, it's our hope that as we begin to ask this self, ask ourselves this question, how is my soul? How is your soul? We want you to make this a personal question. And the reason we want you to ask this is because we want you to live with this awareness. This awareness is our series big idea that In Jesus, your soul is okay, even when circumstances are not okay. That in Jesus, the world can be falling apart on the outside, but you can understand and you can trust and you can realize and you can live knowing this, that on the inside, you are okay when the world around you is not okay. That when things aren't going your way, and the things are going your way and the way that you want in life, that you can be okay because your soul is in Jesus. And it's this confidence that when things in our life aren't the way we want it, we can say, it is well with my soul. That when things aren't going well, you can say, it is well with my soul. That your soul is okay even when circumstance is okay. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this series. And if we're going to talk about our souls, and we need to, if we're going to talk about this and we're going to learn to ask this question, how is my soul? We need to learn and understand what our soul actually is. I mean, you need to ask the question, what is our soul? I mean, we can talk about souls all day long. We, we, enter, we use this language a lot. If there's a plane crash, we'll say it, or the newscaster will say, that there are a hundred souls on board. Or we'll say, hey, I found my soulmate. But do we even really know what the soul is? I mean, have you ever really tried to define what the soul is? And, and we can talk about someone else being a troubled soul. But we might not even know what a soul really is. And so in this, we want to help you understand what the soul is. And it, uh, to help you understand this a little better, I want to share with you a quick metaphor that I read in a book titled Soul Keeping by John Ortenberg. If you're a reader, I encourage you to read this book. It's a great, a great book as he talks about this. But in this book, the, John Ortenberg, a pastor and, uh, and an author, writes about our soul. And he uses a metaphor of a, of a person who's tends the creek, and he talks about a stream at the top of a mountain. And, it's, and, and there's, our souls are like a stream at the top of a mountain. And when the stream that fee is tended to at the top of the mountain, and when, it, when it's tended to at the top of the mountain, and the, the person at the top of the mountain tends the stream by taking away the sticks, the debris, that would eventually pollute the stream if it didn't be it wasn't tended to that in this if as the person would remove the sticks and the debris the stream continues to be a beautiful life-giving stream to the city and the city below it becomes healthy however when the stream is left untended the debris and the waste and the, of the untended stream pollutes the city and the people, pollutes the landscape, the animals that enjoy it, and the city and everything around it and the environment becomes unhealthy. See, the life of the city is dependent upon the stream, and the stream and the life of the stream is dependent upon the stream's keeper. And to restore health and life to the city, someone needs to tend to the stream. And later in his book, after explaining this metaphor of what our souls are like, he would say this, our soul is like a stream of water, which gives strength, direction, and harmony to every other area of our life. See, your soul is your stream, and you are the tender of your stream. You are the keeper of your stream. And as the keeper of our stream, we need to recognize that our stream is, is, is the center of our life, that our soul is the center of our life. In fact, write this in, that your soul is the most important thing about you. It is your life. 
that it, 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 it's everything of, about you, that your soul is your life. And as the keeper of your soul, you have a responsibility. And your responsibility is to maintain your soul's health. It's to understand your soul. And when it's starting to be unhealthy, it's your responsibility to recognize that. And it's our responsibility to tend to our streams. In other words, you need to learn how to tend to maintaining your soul. So I want to ask you today, how's your soul? I mean, can you, un- can, you, can you identify how your soul is? Well, we won't really know how it is until we really know what it is. And so to help you understand what your soul is, I've, I want to just come up here to the board real quickly and help you understand this. See, your soul is everything about you. And write this in your notes. See, your soul is what unites your will. It unites your mind and your body. Your soul unites your will, your mind, and your body. This is your soul. This, your soul is what the Genesis author would write in Genesis 2, verse 7, when he would, the, the writer would write about breathing life into man. And it, God would form man out of the dust of the earth, and he would breathe life into him, and it became a living being. And the word being there is interpreted as being, but the, the Hebrew word there is, is means soul, that you and I became living souls because God has breathed life into us. And your life, your soul, has a will. It, your will is a center part of your life. This is, this is your, the, the center, the most central part of your life. It's the most inner circle of your life. It's your will. And this is what, your intentions. This is what God, we read, read about in Genesis, where God would give mankind dominion over everything else. It's because we have a will. And God has given you a will. And it's central to who you are. But i got to tell you something about your will. Your will is limited. Your will is limited. And the reason that your will is limited is, and, and I'll prove it to you, have you ever tried to will yourself into doing something? How well did that work out for you? Not so well. You know why it didn't work out for you? Because you have a mind. Every new year, you might buy something new. You might get that gym membership. Are you going to tell yourself, I'm going to work out until you talk yourself out of it? You buy that new piece of equipment, you're going to use it until you talk yourself out of doing it because your, your will is limited and your mind engages. And see, why your will is your intentions, your mind is your intellect, your mind is the thoughts, the feelings, the values that you have, your conscience. This is what Paul would talk about in Romans chapter 8, that you have a mind. And the mind that's governed by your flesh or your selfish nature is, is against God. And he would say that the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit, the way God wants your mind to be governed, is life and peace. And, and, and when we have integrity in our souls, when there's integrity here, there's life and peace. When there's integrity with our mind and our will, and we also have bodies. See, the body that you and I have is the way that it, it, it like carries out the operating system of our will and our mind. That's, it, it, it is expressed out in our bodies, the, the, the facial expressions, our body language, the way we move and our actions is, is, this, is, is, is what this encompasses. And here's the reality. See, science will teach you that you are a body, but you're not a body. You're a soul that has a body. And you're a soul that not just has a body, you're a soul that has a mind and you're a soul that has a will. And our soul is what integrates all of these into one single life, your life. This is your soul. And when we are complete, when we are fully fulfilled, and when you're the best part the way God designed you to be, when you're well-ordered and there's integrity here, this is where healthy souls are. See, healthy souls are when everything is ordered and, and there's integrity amongst all of these right here. When we are connected with God and with people. See, you have a healthy soul. See, when you realize that your connection with God is unbroken, and not only that, but your connection with people is unbroken. It's a reflection of your healthy Soul. See, in your soul, if it's healthy, no external circumstances. John Ordberg would write this. He would say, if your soul is healthy, no external circumstances can destroy your life. But left unhealthy, 
left unmaintained without integrity in your soul. No external circumstances can redeem or fulfill that life. And what did Jesus come to save? See, Jesus didn't come to save you from your circumstances. Jesus didn't come to make your life better on the outside. Jesus came to save you and I. He came to save our souls. See, without Jesus, you and I are lost souls. And the reason we're lost is because we have a broken relationship with God that has been broken by a curse of sin that has cursed our souls. That you were born into this curse. You were born into a broken relationship with God. And because, you're, because you don't have a, a pure relationship with God when we're born, it leads us to naturally break our relationships with others. And the reason that we break our relationships with others, it's a reflection of the brokenness in our life and the brokenness in our souls. See, without Jesus, without, without him, we're lost souls. And this is why Jesus would invite you and I. This is why Jesus would invite you and I to follow him. And if you're not a Christ follower, this is his invitation for you because he wants you to become not a lost soul. He wants you to become a fulfilled and complete soul without brokenness in your life. And, but the way that Jesus would invite you and I to follow him it seems so different. In fact, it's backwards to the way the world would invite you to follow him. It's upside down, if you will. And this is the way Matthew, a, a disciple of Jesus, would talk about it. He would write Jesus' words and record this teaching of Jesus because this was an invitation Jesus gave to him, but he gives to everyone. See, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is why we talk about this verse a lot. It's an important verse in our relationship with God because this is a verse that's all about your soul. You want to have a healthy soul? This is what Jesus says. you got to deny yourself. you got to die, your, die to yourself, and then you come follow me. And this is why he says that. He goes, for whoever wants to save their, and I want you to circle the word life here. It's so important. Whoever wants to save their life. You want to save your life? I think everyone here, every one of us would like to say, yeah, I want to save my life. That's why I do everything I do, because I want to preserve, I want to save, I want to be complete. But that word life isn't what you think of life. That word life in the original language is psyche, which is interpreted as soul. In fact, you're going to see here in a little bit that they interpret the same word as soul. He goes, whoever wants to save their soul, what's he go on to say? Will lose it. But whoever loses their, circle that word again, life. And then I want you to underline these two words or make them different, show the difference. He goes, for me. Because whoever wants it, that, same, that life is the same word as psyche, that same word for soul. But whoever loses their soul for me will find it. See, you're going to search for, you're going to lose your soul. You're going to lose your soul for something. That's just the pathway humanity takes. And in this, this is what Jesus is saying. I'll tell you the way to life is you're going to lose your soul for something. If you're going to lose your soul for anything, lose your soul for me. Lose your soul for me. And the reason you need to lose your soul for me is because of this right here. Because whoever, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? See, if you lose your soul for Jesus, you're going to find life in him, he says. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. And see, this is not as much a teaching about heaven or hell as Jesus is diagnosing the state of our human soul. He's diagnosing what we are. See, we can pursue the world, and you and I can pursue the world to fulfill our life outside of Jesus. And if you try to find significance, you try to find fulfillment, you try to seek affirmation, or you try to find anything that God built you to need outside of your relationship with God... You know what he says? You lose. But don't just lose something. You lose everything. You lose your soul. See, nothing in this world can provide for you what your soul needs to live. To pursue the world, to live, to fulfill your life outside of Jesus is to lose your soul. To, to lose your soul would be like being a boat on the sea, in the middle of the sea, without an anchor. To lose your soul would be like being in a car and driving down the highway without a steering wheel. But if we are going to lose our soul for anything, we need to lose our soul for Jesus. Because he is the giver 
of life. See, your soul was created to need God, the giver of your life, and to seek fulfillment outside of Jesus, to seek significance without Jesus, to seek purpose without Jesus, to find fulfillment in anything other than Jesus, Jesus says, is to lose your soul. See, your soul is needy. And your soul is needy because you were created to need God. And there's an eternal craving inside of all of us. And that eternal craving that will never be satisfied until it's satisfied with an eternal being, God himself. So I want to ask you today, how's your soul? How's your soul? Is it empty? Is it wanting? Is it craving something? Now, our world and our culture has replaced this word soul with ourself. And this is, uh, this is sad because our world and our culture wants you to live for yourself. They want you to find yourself. They want you to discover the true you. They want you to become the true self that you were created to be. It's all about improving yourself. It's all about finding <clears throat> yourself. And Jesus never talks about never talked about self the same way the culture talks about self. In fact, yourself and your soul, according to Jesus, are not the same thing. In fact, write this in your notes. The more your life is about yourself, the more you neglect your soul. And the more your soul becomes empty and disconnected. See, a healthy soul has a great connection with God, and a healthy soul has a connection with the people around us. And a healthy soul is centered on God, and it's not centered on itself. That to center on God is to make life. Jesus said to center your life on God, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is the greatest commandment. And he would say the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. See, you can't ultimately love God. You can't have a relationship with God. You can't have an integrity with God in a, in a life-giving, soul-filling, fulfilling life. And be disconnected in relationships with each other. See, a healthy soul doesn't seek its own pleasure. A healthy soul doesn't seek its own self as its most important interest. See, a healthy soul is, is, is what Jesus wants you and I to have. And he invites you to do it by following him. And it's about denying yourself, not finding yourself. It's about denying yourself and dying to yourself. See, there's true life in denying yourself and dying to yourself. But to make life all about yourself, to make it all about you, is to lose something. It's to have a broken soul when you make life about you. And when you make life about you, isn't that selfishness that disconnects us in our relationship with God? And isn't it our selfishness that disconnects us and our relationships with each other. See, to make life about ourselves is a symptom of an empty or disconnected soul. And when you and I become selfish, we become disconnected from God and others. And there's something that happens into our li- in our lives when we don't get what we want in life. See, in this, when we don't get what we want in life, our souls turn toxic. See, the condition of your soul is revealed when life doesn't go the way you want. That's how the condition of your soul is. There's an indicator on the dashboard of your life that you see when you don't get what you want in life. The, you re, the real you is revealed when you don't get what you want. The soul, your soul, is, it comes to the surface, it, and it might not be seen by everybody else, but you see it. You know what's going on in the inside. And when you work hard on the house and, and, and you work hard on making it right, great for all the guests that come along and, and everybody comes in and nobody says anything. And you know what goes on in the inside of your heart. And you don't get the affirmation that you want. Or you know that what goes on in, inside of you when your teenager brings home grades that you don't want them to have. And there's something that happens inside of you. Because you didn't get what you wanted. Or something happens and, and, and that employee, that, you're, that colleague at work gets a promotion that you've been really going after. And you know what's happening inside. And if something happens, it's, a, it's an indicator of what's going on in your soul. It's a reflection of it. 
And see, we need to pay attention to this right here. We need to pay attention to what is going on in our souls at the moment that we don't get what we expect in life. You need to pay attention to that. Because if you're not careful to tend to that right there, if you're not careful to become your soul's keeper in this moment, your soul can become empty and your soul can become, in your life stream, that stream of your life, your soul can become muddied and garbled. And, and all it is is because you're not getting what you want because you have expectations that are not met. And you got to listen to that. See, if you expect life to go a certain way and it doesn't go the way you want it to go, your soul will either have the strength to endure it or you will demand it or demand something from others. Because when we don't get what we want, if you don't get what you want from others, an unhealthy soul will turn you bitter and you will take it out on others. See, when expectations are not met, an unhealthy soul will take the pathway to bitterness. When your expectations in life aren't met and you don't tend to your soul well, you have the opportunity and you, an unhealthy soul that doesn't, a person that doesn't tend to their soul well will take, begin a pathway toward bitterness. And the state of our soul will determine how quickly you take this path down toward bitterness. And I know we don't like to use the word bitterness. And I know we don't like that but because none of us would say, hey, we're bitter souls. I mean, hey, Casey, my name's Casey. I'm a bitter soul. Nobody introduces yourself that way. But let me tell you where this pathway begins. Maybe you can understand this. You ever been frustrated? See, frustration. You know what that happens? If you don't tend to that frustration in that moment, when, when, when your teenager comes and they, they, they told you they're going to clean their room and they don't, if you don't tend to your soul right there in that moment, it can lead to a path toward irritation where it just becomes, it's still inside and becomes to just build up and boil on the inside of you and then all of a sudden your impatience kicks in and now you're aggravated at this whole situation. And now what you've done is you've not tended to your soul and what you do in that moment is you become more aggravated and you lean into anger and now that's coming out of you. And so everyone knows that you've moved past irritation and aggravation. Now everybody knows you're angry. And if you don't deal and you don't tend to your soul appropriately, you can make a, take a path toward bitterness. See, every one of these emotions are what we experience when we don't get what we want or expect from someone else. Every one of those are something you experience when you don't get what you want. And this is why you need to listen to your soul when you're first frustrated. See, what is that thing that you're, you want but you're not getting in life? What is it that you want but you're not getting in life? Have you ever met someone who has a problem with everybody? Have you ever met that person? I mean, they just got a problem with everybody. I read a book one time where they said, when Bob's got a problem with everybody, Bob's the problem. You ever get to those moments where it's just frustrated and, and everything frustrates you? Everything irritates you? Everyone irritates you? You got to listen. What's it indicating? See, there's freedom. I want you to know that there's freedom in knowing that when circumstances don't go your way, when other people don't do what you want in life, you can be okay. And you can be okay when circumstances don't go your way. And this is the message that James, that the half-brother of Jesus, wanted the church to know. And James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem in the first century. Right after Jesus left, James appears on the scene. And James, we don't see much about James in the gospel. And here's the most remarkable thing about James. See, James would later write to this church. And the reason he would write to this church is because they were being persecuted. And he wanted to lead this persecuted church because this, this was before Rome Christianized or legalized Christianity. And it was fun to be a Christian or it was good to be a Christian. This is when they were killing Christians. When the, his church, the people of his church, were, were dying for their faith. They were having things taken away from them because they simply believed in Jesus. That was their only, their only crime. They were being treated as criminals because of their faith in Jesus. And James writes to this church, 
And to a church that was, they were losing their life for their faith. And we don't know how much long after James wrote this letter that James himself would give up his very own life for what he believed. And if you're skeptical here today and you're skeptical about who Jesus is, I just want you to think about this. Because the writer of this sermon that we're going to share this little passage from, he was the half-brother of Jesus. And he died because he believed that his brother was his Savior, his God, and his king. And this is what he says to a church where circumstances are not okay. He opens up his letter. And he says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Those of you that are in this with me, those of you that are being persecuted, those of you that are with circumstances aren't your way, consider it pure joy whenever you face many trials. And then he would go on talking about how the beauty of facing a trial leads to perseverance and creates endurance in us. And then he would take the wisdom of Proverbs and and some of these things, and he would preach on this, and he would tie it to the teachings of Jesus in this letter. And he would get to a point in his teaching where where he would talk about the opportunity every one of us has to become bitter. And this is what he would say. Who is wise and understanding among you? Who, Who here is wise and understanding among us? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in, I want you to circle that word, humility. In humility. That comes from wisdom. Why did he use the word humility? Because this is what Jesus taught about. Humility. Jesus lived and modeled and taught a life that puts other people first because that's what humility does. And then he would go on to write, but if you harbor, if you harbor, If there's any bitter envy in you, if there's anything in your life that would lead to this bitterness, if there's any bitter envy, and what do you say? And selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. I mean, after all, what's the path to bitterness? I mean, the path to bitterness starts with what? Not getting what we want. Isn't that the path to bitterness? And so why do we become bitter? I mean, what creates bitter envy? Well, someone has what you want. That's what bitter envy is. It's someone has what you want and you think you deserve it. And really what's the root of that? It's our selfish ambition, he says. And see, when we are selfish, James says we deny the truth of Jesus' teachings in our life. And James says selfishness and bitterness are not wise. And that's what he goes on to say. He goes, such wisdom does not come down from heaven but is earthly, unspiritual. He even goes to say demonic. And then he goes on to say this, for wherever you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. I mean, those are harsh words. What's he saying? Anytime there's selfishness, you have the capability of doing a evil. See, not denying yourself and making life all about yourself can lead you to a path that you break a relationship with someone because you want something they have that you're not getting and it leads you to break that relationship and do something in evil against them and maybe James remembered the sayings of Jesus when he was writing about this when he the one we just read that if you want to save yourself you've got to deny yourself you got to lose yourself and then he would go on to write but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure then peace loving considerate submissive and full of mercy. He gives us a list here of everything that is other oriented, other people oriented. And he goes, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And then look what he says here peacemakers, peacemakers who sow in peace, reap a harvest of righteousness. And what James does next gets the cord of all of our problems. All your problems are connected to right here. He says this What causes fights and quarrels among you? In which I would want to say, no, James, you got that wrong. It's not a what, it's a who. I mean, because really, it's my ex or it's my boss. That's who's causing the fight. It's my parent. It's my mom or my dad. That's who's causing this fight, the quarrel. No, he's like, no, 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 don't think about who. I want you to think about you. What? What in you causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires? Don't they come from what you want? Don't they come from your desires, desires that battle within you? I mean, after all, why is the reason you're mad at your kid? Well, they're, they're not behaving 
the, the way that you should behave. Why, why, what's the way they should be? Well, it's not. It's the way I want them to behave. Oh, you're not getting what you want. Why are you so mad at your employee, the, the colleague that got that raise that you didn't get? Is it because they got the raise? No, you want them to get a raise. No, it's because you wanted that raise. Why are you mad at your parent? You, you, they're not treating me fairly. Oh, so you want fairness. Oh, yeah, I want something. See, we wrestle and we quarrel, he says, because of the desires that battle within us. We don't get what we want. And then he says something really harsh. We desire but do not have, so we kill. I mean, that's harsh, but maybe he was remembering what Jesus said, that Matthew records that if you're angry with someone, it's like murder. See, if we're angry because we can't control the outcome, or we may, what's going to stop us then from losing control in our own life? And he goes on to say, but you covet and you cannot get what you want. Isn't that the core of it? You cannot get what we want. So what you do, you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not. And look at this. He says you don't have because you don't go to God and ask him. See, Jesus would tell you and I to lose your soul for him. To lose your soul for him. And your soul was made to need God. So you need to go to God when your soul is wanting and in need. See, I want to ask, I want to ask you a question to ask. I want to ask you to ask this question. What is it that you're wanting from someone else that you are desperately needing from God? What is it in your life that you're wanting someone else to give you that you really need from God. Because that's why we don't have it, because we're not going to the person that can fill our life. That affirmation that you want, you know, maybe you want your kids to look good. Maybe it's because you want your kids to look good, and that's what you want because it makes you look bad, but you don't realize that you, it doesn't matter what you look like because before God, you have all the significance in the world. And your kids value and what they do to you doesn't mean anything. See, when you don't get what you want, you have a choice in this moment. You can either choose to move toward bitterness or you can choose to move toward peace. In this moment, when you're not getting what you want and you begin to little, be a little frustrated, you can choose to go down this path or you can choose peace. You can either choose an irritation to, to go toward down this path or you can choose peace. At any moment, you have a choice to either go down the path of bitterness or you can choose to move down a path of peace. See, we can do what's wise and what Jesus teaches and move toward peace. And we do that the same way Jesus moved toward us. See, Jesus moved toward us and established peace with you. You know how he established peace with you? He forgave you. When you didn't give him what he wanted, and I didn't give him what he wanted, a relationship with him, but he wanted us to be wholly his, but we turned our back on him. And what does he do? He doesn't demand something from us. You know what he does? He takes the penalty upon himself and he forgives us. And this is the teaching big idea that I want you to know today. See, we tend to our soul by forgiving others from the forgiveness we've received in Jesus. That at any moment in your life that you're not getting what you want and you begin frustrated, begin to get frustrated with the other person, you have a choice I can go down this path or I can say, you know what, they're not giving me what I want. But you know what, I'm not going to make them pay that penalty. I'm going to absorb that penalty because that's what forgiveness is. You know what forgiveness is? It's absorbing the penalty. It's absorbing the payment for what is owed to you. What do you want that you're not getting from somebody else? What is it? And what do you need to extend to them because of what you've already received in Jesus? See, when we don't get what we want, we can move toward peace by offering 
forgiveness. I love what Tim Keller says. He says the essence of forgiveness is absorbing the pain instead of giving it back. So how do we fight for peace in this moment and move away from this path to bitterness? How do we do that? We choose to forgive. How do we tend to our souls whenever we're irritated? We choose a path that Jesus chose for us. We renew our minds and submit our will to God and then our soul finds out what it desperately needs. What God has given you. This is why Jesus would say, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. He says, take my teachings, my way of life and you follow me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And then he says this, and you will find rest for your souls because his yoke is easy and his burden light. Today I want to ask you a question. Do you need to receive Jesus' forgiveness today? Maybe today is an opportunity that you need to just accept his forgiveness for you because you've never, you, you've never allowed him to fill the void of your life that you've been looking to fill with everything else. And you've realized that today, the reason that you're so empty inside is because you're not letting him fill that void by receiving his forgiveness. Today, we're going to take communion, and this is an invitation for you, that as an act of trusting in God for his forgiveness in your life that he gave you through Jesus, I'm going to invite you to join us in communion today. That this would be your demonstration to God that you trust in him as your savior and Lord and the savior of your soul. Or maybe you're here today and you've received God's forgiveness, but you're withholding forgiveness from somebody else. And you've been wanting something from somebody and you need to drop it. You need to choose peace by moving toward peace by forgiving and that means you're not going to demand them anything else from them you're going to drop it you're going to take a path to peace does it mean that you don't have consequences no there doesn't mean you don't have consequences it means that you're not going to demand something back from them and as we come forward in communion today will you take this cup and will you think about the person that you need to drop it and may you just in your heart say god i drop this today I want you to ex come forward on the left and you're good, you're let's come back to the, the right-hand side of your aisle and return to your seat. And we're going to take those together right before we leave. Will you stand with me? And will you begin to come forward as our people serve us today and we sing together? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him my own, sin had left a crimson stain, he Washed it white as snow. For oh, now, indeed, I find thy power in thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of. Sin had left a crimson 
stain he washed it white as snow sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow he washed it white came to save our broken souls by offering us forgiveness. And the way that he could offer us forgiveness is he became broken because that was the payment for sin. As he became broken so you wouldn't have to be broken. And he took that payment upon himself to save us. And communion is a reminder of what Jesus has done for us, but it's also a reminder of what we do for others. And we forgive others because we've been forgiven. Will you remember that by taking the bread with me today? And the reason we're forgiven is not just because his body was broken, but because his blood was shed. And he gave up his life so you could lose your life for him. And he gave us the opportunity to find life by receiving his forgiveness. And we get to share that life with others as we give forgiveness. That's what communion reminds us of. Will you remember that with me right now? Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for coming to pay it all. May we honor your life and may we truly live the life that you've called us to live by denying ourselves and dying to ourselves and following you so we can find life in you and our souls can be healthy. And many times that someone gives us or doesn't give us what we want, may we choose the path toward peace by forgiving them and the forgiveness we've received in you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Our prayer partners are going to be available today. Guests new with us, don't forget to take your connect card to the back. Thank you for joining us in the offering today. God bless you, Westside. We'll see you next Sunday.